It's March 1st, 1932, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Ever since he had made the first ever non-stop solo transatlantic flight in the spirit of St. Louis in 1927, clean-cut aviator Charles Lindbergh had been a household name to every American patriot. So when his 20-month-old son, Charlie Jr., who had been dubbed the Eaglet by the adoring press, vanished from his nursery today in history in 1932, the scene was set for a media circus of epic proportions. Yeah, this really was a huge deal in the American press. It's kind of equivalent to the British press talking about Madeleine McCann in the 21st century. It was a story that everybody knew, partly because um, it had the tragedy of a missing baby at the centre of it, but partly because of that celebrity of Charles Lindbergh that you alluded to. So the clues that the media had to go on were that the kidnapper had used a ladder to climb up to the open second floor window and left muddy footprints in the room. On further inspection of the nursery, the people who had taken the baby left this note demanding $50,000 for the return of baby Charlie and it was apparently crudely written. Yeah, the next day's papers were full of breathless accounts of the mystery. It was the start of a prolonged nationwide frenzy which also led to countless unhelpful reported sightings and false leads. Uh, the local newspaper, this was taking place in Hopewell, New Jersey, where they had their, where the Lindberghs had their mansion. The Hopewell Herald wrote, the crime has brought on the biggest newspaper scoop in the history of journalism, not accepting the First World War. Over 900 writers, photographers, telegraph operators, radio announcers and engineers, aviators, police and detectives are stationed in this area. Every form of communication known to science connects Hopewell at the present time with the world. The town is shrouded in a veritable web of telephone wires. Yeah, another person who kindly offered to uh, lend his assistance was Al Capone, who <laughs> offered to help from prison, which I can only assume was a sort of, uh, you know, rehabilitation of image type of an effort. I'm not sure that really works. Yeah. It demonstrates my ability, even behind bars, to control the entire underworld. But the person who was officially appointed by the New Jersey State Police was uh, Colonel H. Schwarzkopf, who was the father of the Gulf War leader General Norman, you know, Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf. Um, and a retired school principal, Dr. Condon, offered to act as a go-between and to pay an additional $1,000 ransom himself. This was just a member of the public who'd been reading about it in the papers. <laughs> yeah, he was a retired teacher. He was quite eccentric, and it seems like he was spending his retirement basically writing letters to the editor. His local paper was the Bronx Home News, and it was in that publication that his letter appeared, offering his services as a go-between. The kidnapper contacted him, took him up on it, and there followed this really, you know, cinematic exchange of cryptic messages placed in newspapers to one another, notes that were handed to him by intermediaries who sort of ran away, and then these sort of treasure hunt style trails yeah. of clues. 13 ransom notes in total. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of ransom notes. At what point can you stop calling them ransom notes? You know? yeah, exactly. At some point you're just a pen pal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, they, and the first meetup took place in a cemetery on the 11th of March. Just a bit of a sizing up situation. But he had proven that he did have the baby, didn't he? Because they gave over a sleeping suit that they recognised, pyjamas from the baby as proof of identity. Yeah. The second meetup took place on the 2nd of April. Condon came, Lindbergh was with him, but Lindbergh stayed in the car. Um, Condon handed over $50,000 to the man that he only knew as John, the kidnapper or representative of the kidnapper. Uh, and in return, John handed over a note saying that Charlie Jr. was on a boat called Nelly near Elizabeth Island, which is sort of in the Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod area. But... You know, the the sad truth was that even though they then mounted this enormous uh, search for that boat, that it, it was never found. Well, I mean, and it probably never existed because about a month later, a passing trucker about four miles away from the Lindbergh mansion happened upon the decomposed body of a young child that was identified as Charlie. And it was determined that he had probably died shortly after being abducted from a blow to the head, whether intentional or accidental is not clear. But it meant that whoever the kidnapper was, and they did have Charlie's pyjamas, that they already knew that he was dead and that he died pretty soon after the abduction had taken place. I mean, I'm no detective and I haven't looked at all the evidence, but I'm sure they didn't... I mean, it's not like the baby could have ever positively identified them, is it? I'm sure they intended to return the baby alive. It sounds like a tragic accident, doesn't it? And in fact, they, the Lindberghs 
retrospectively realised they'd heard the sound of something banging to the floor on the day that the child went missing. Mm. And there's a school of thought that that was the sound of the child hitting the floor, hitting the ladder on the way out the window, and that's when it died from this blow to the head. It's just that then the kidnappers followed through as if it was still alive. Yeah, and just the atmosphere generally, I think, was so different because I think now we're in such a stranger danger era that when you hear about an abducted child, your mind immediately goes to the worst case scenario. Mm. But at that time, there had been a lot of high profile kidnappings, you know, straightforward, old fashioned, give us the ransom money in a bag and you can have your child or wife Mm. or whoever bag. And that was really where everyone's minds went. So finding out that the baby had died was a huge shock. It wasn't Mm. just this, you know, semi inevitable tragedy that everyone was waiting for. People were genuinely Mm. astonished to think that somebody could have killed a child that they'd kidnapped. Though at the same time, I think there was this sense that even at the point at which they handed over the money, they may not be getting the baby. And we know that because about $40,000 worth of the Lindbergh ransom money had been paid in the form of gold certificates. And they were basically, when the US dollar was tied to gold, these were a certificate that indicated that you owned that amount of gold. But in 1933, as a result of the depression, an executive order came down that stated that all gold certificates needed to be returned to the treasury. And this made the money that had been given to the kidnappers even more traceable, plus all of the bills that they had uh, handed over in this exchange of money had also been meticulously recorded. You know, the serial numbers of the banknotes had been written down. So they knew what they were looking for and soon the money started to turn up. And this was a crucial piece of evidence against Bruno Richard Hauptmann, who was the man who was put on trial in the end for this crime, because a $20 gold certificate was found on his person and the serial numbers matched those that were missing. His description fitted with that of, quote, John, as seen by Dr Condon. In his house, there was a pair of shoes which had also been purchased with one of the $20 bills that had been paid as part of the ransom. His handwriting was similar to the ransom notes. There were tool marks on the ladder that matched tools that he owned. But you'll see that what I'm not saying is they found evidence of there having been a child in his house Mm. or anyone saying that Bruno Richard Hauptmann had been anywhere in New Jersey to steal this child. It was all circumstantial. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it was. The fact that it was circumstantial doesn't mean that it wasn't abundant, though. One thing that you neglected to mention was he had thirteen thousand dollars worth of the ransom gold certificates in his garage. He claimed they'd been left with him by a friend who had since gone back to Germany, where he was originally from, and conveniently died. The other thing was that it wasn't just the, the, the tool marks ma- match the ladder. This was actually the first ever use of forensic botany in a trial. A witness called Arthur Kohler, who was a chief wood technologist with the United States Forest Service was called to testify and he was able to demonstrate conclusively that one of the rungs of the homemade ladder used in the kidnapping was made from a floor plank taken from Hauptmann's attic. (laughs) It's quite hard to get. Although defenders of Hauptmann, of whom there are some, will say that he was a carpenter by trade. He literally worked at a lumberyard. Why would he take a plank from the attic of his own rented house to make a ladder? But I mean, it is pretty hard to deny the connection there, at least. Despite the sexiness of the intervention of a uh, forensic botanist. It's just not one of those professions that kids <laughs> aspire to these days. Um, but, you know, the trial of the century as it became known yes. unfolded. This was OJ in levels, this way. right? This was it huge. Was. Yeah, the, and there was a crowd of 60,000 observers who uh, came through the courtroom over the course of the five weeks that it ran for, and the jury found uh, Hauptmann guilty of first degree murder and sentenced him to death. I mean, he didn't get the fairest trial in the world, it has to be said. Aside from the unproven but rampant allegations of evidence tampering and planting of evidence, he was discriminated against in the courtroom for being an immigrant. At one point, the prosecutor said that an American couldn't have committed this crime. That was, you know, that, that was considered an acceptable thing to tell a jury. It was also an established fact that Hauptmann was a victim of police brutality on at least one occasion while being held in jail. He later claimed that one of the pieces of evidence against him, which was the handwriting analysis, he said he had been forced to copy the ransom note in order for the handwriting to be proved to be the same. So I, there, there are, you know, there's a lot of evidence against Hauptmann, but it is clear that he certainly didn't get a fair trial by modern definition. But he also protested his innocence all along. I mean, that's the the unsettling thing is he he got mm. electrocuted 
But all the way up until 1992, his then 93-year-old widow, Anna, gave a press conference saying, my husband was never, never near the Lindbergh home. They killed an innocent man. I think the main problem that we're going to have to come to terms with, you guys, is that we're not going to get to the bottom of this one because none of us is a forensic botanist. (laughs) (laughs) Tomorrow. The emperor believed God was on his side when he was about to be invaded. Baraceri wanted to retreat. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.